Hello there, sword friends. This is going to be a review of a Dark Sword Armory 15th century hand and a half sword. Long sword, bastard sword, something kind of sword. Now, before I go into my normal spiel, some things to note. One, I got the sword secondhand, so it may not be representative of what you would get from Dark Sword Armory if you bought one new, though it seems pretty tit for tat for what you would expect to get, uh, though mine comes with a little extra rust. Uh, two, I'm not a practitioner of historic European martial arts, and I claim no mastery in the subject, so just know this review is my thoughts and kind of my thoughts alone, and take for a grain of salt whatever you hear because I, I don't know what I'm doing with this type of sword or really any sword. The uh, other bit is that Dark Sword Armory and I have no affiliation. Uh, I've got the sword with my own money secondhand. Nobody's asking me to do the review, and so, you know, there's that. On with the regularly scheduled programming. The first thing that I'd like to note is kind of what you get with this sword. So if I switch over to my little web page here, uh, this is the website that shows said sword and it looks pretty much what, you know, like what I have. Uh, the things to note are what they include for measurements and whatnot. So actually overall total length, mine is just about a half inch longer. Blade at length, mine is just a little bit shorter. Width is pretty much on par, but the point of balance probably notably because mine is a half an inch longer in total but has a shorter blade the point of balance is actually closer to two inches on the blade than i have now four inches and two inches might not sound like a big divide but it makes a pretty pretty significant difference in how the blade feels and handles uh the closer the point of balance is to the the hilt in general uh, the more kind of lively and point controllable the the blade feels in in my experience now that's not a one size fits all rule there's a lot of a lot of things to it but do note that the point of balance on mine is, is quite a bit closer now if i were thinking i wanted a four inch point of balance it might be because I, I wanted it to feel a certain way for cutting or handling and two inches would to me as a customer make a pretty significant difference in how the blade feels also note the weight uh mine is actually three pounds so it's got a slightly longer overall length a slightly shorter blade and is about one ounce short uh, one ounce less in weight and all of that is probably contributing to the uh, the point of balance being closer to two inches on mine. Now the uh, unit that I have is actually this one. So scabbard and blade 475 sharpened. Uh, there's a few different options. You get a belt or a blunt and there's some varying prices. Note that it goes from $440 all the way to $565. I have the $475 iteration and that's kind of what I'm gonna be comparing it to on the rest of the market. Now as I look at the rest of the market, uh, what do I have to compare it to? So here's $475. Uh, what I can find for 15th century hand and a half swords are, uh, you know, I don't know that all of these are 15th century, but here's a piece from Deepika that seems quite a bit different, though it comes with, uh, you know, a, sh a scabbard of, of some sort. There's probably some piece from Windless. Here's Cold Steel, though I don't know if this is necessarily hand and a half. Uh, well, it's a hand and a half sword, but I don't know if it's representative of something from the 15th century. Here's a Hanway hand and a half sword again. I don't know how close any of these are to 15th century pieces. Uh, Legacy arms. Now here's a Ronin Katana. Uh, Crusader longsword, a new iteration from them. Again, I don't know how, how really close any of these are to hand and a half swords. Here's a, a Delton 15th century sword, but I don't know this looks like hand and a half. Uh, the thing is, I don't necessarily know what exactly a 15th century hand and a half sword is. Now because of the name, I'm going to assume that it's supposed to represent something from a period in history, though as a 16, a, you know, an Oakshot type 16A blade is, is what it's supposed to have, but it's not really a, an Oakshot. It doesn't fit into something from a medieval period. There may have been something like it, but I haven't been able to find it. The point is, because it says 15th century, I, I assume by the name that it's supposed to represent something from a period in history. and from what little I understand of the historic martial art at the time, there's an arms race going on between swords and warfare weapons and armor and all, all of the like. And so at, at the 15th century time frame, depending on when it is, uh, but you may have plate mail armor, you may have chain mail, and this shape seems pretty representative of something that would be intended to be, you know, option A, the, the narrow point would maybe find a, be able to pierce through or widen a gap in chain mail, or two, it may be able to, to find kind of a gap in the plate of a plate mail armor. So I'm thinking of it from the standpoint that it's more of a thrusting sword, more made to find gaps in plate mail or expand the rings in chain mail, and that's really its intended purpose rather than a cutting sword. Now I'm gonna cut with it later, you'll see some of that, but I think of as a 15th century hand and a half sword, my, my frame of mind, just so you 
are aware as you hear my thoughts is that this sword is primarily geared to be able to put that pointy part through a ring and chain mail so it should be stiff enough to potentially do that and two it should be able to be handleable in such a way that maybe you could half sword or put that point into the gap in plate mail cutting it's a sword so it should be able to cut but i don't know that that's the primary objective now as a hand and a half sword the way i think of hand and a half swords is that it's supposed to be something that i could use with one hand but could also use with two and so as I, as I think of hand and a half, maybe I'm off in that perspective, but I think of a hand and a half sword as one that I, I can use or is primarily geared for one-handed use, but that can be used with two. And so as I think of, does it fit that bill? That's, that's what I'm going into this review looking for. As I noted on the measurements on the website, there are some disparities, though I would argue that the disparities almost make it more applicable to what its intended purpose is. Uh, the shorter point of balance gives me more of a sense of, of tip feeling. Um, it doesn't necessarily help me cut any better, but I don't know that that's the primary objective, and it gives it a balanced sense when I hold it either with one hand or two. Anyway, let's move on to the, the review, and I'm going to examine some of the quality characteristics in terms of assembly and whatnot. Looking at the pommel, what I see is a Type-T pommel, at least from what I've been able to ascertain. It's a scepter-style pommel. Now, the peen is actually, I mean, it could be better looking. It does the job, and it's not the ugliest that I've seen, but it's pretty far from the best. The shape of the scepter is nice, but the lines on the side are dull. And as I compare this to, say, an Albion, let me, you know, that might help outline what I mean by dulled lines. The the kind of ridges on the scepter section just don't appear as crisp as they could be. Now, that helps when I'm holding it with one hand. It doesn't feel sharp. Uh, as compared to the Albion, which feels a little bit more rigid in my hand. But at the same time, if you're holding a glove or even barehanded, it just lacks some of the refinement in terms of its appearance that uh, that it could have. It's also worth noting that the scepter shape, as it meets the leather guard, has a ledge on one side. And that ledge is not substantial, but it's enough where if I'm holding it with a bare hand that I feel it, it could dig into my hand. It's in a, it's in a position that could cause some mild discomfort. For the price point, I don't think that's necessarily unacceptable, but it's worth noting that it's there. Overall though, the pommel actually feels really nice. I like that it's got a mirror kind of polish to it. This one actually came with a little bit of rust and I cleaned it up with Mother's Mag, which probably is adding just slightly to the, the mirrored appearance of the unit. But uh, nevertheless, I, I felt that it wasn't really deterring from anything since it came with a very high polish. And honestly, I think it actually looks pretty good. I like the shape. I like how it fits in my hand. I like that it doesn't dig into my hand. Uh, overall, in terms of feeling it, it's very pleasant. Now onto the grip. Uh, the things to note is that the leather, it looks okay. The leather is not overly tight. I mean, it almost feels like I can move it with a really tense grip. As I, as I pull my hands in either direction, I can feel the leather subtly move underneath my fingers. The seam also is very substantial. It stands out quite a bit, but not so much that it, it, it doesn't hurt my fingers if I'm holding it with a bare hand. Now, I've had some lacquered bits of of leather that have a seam on them that then dig into my hands if I'm not using a glove. And in this case, it, it certainly doesn't. It actually is, is very pleasant to feel, but at the same time, it's very substantial looking. It stands out and the leather feels not just as tightly bound okay. as, as what other swords have. Now underneath there, it looks like there is cord underneath. Now it doesn't look like the leather has been lacquered and then bound in cord, but it does look like there's cord over a wood uh, a, a wood grip and in that sense I imagine it adds to the rigidity and overall structural integrity of the blade so that's that's a nice thing to see. The leather, the cord underneath though is actually quite large and so it, it provides some, I don't know, it, it looks kind of muffled. It doesn't have the same kind of crispness that I see in other handles. The, the grip and the cord underneath look kind of like a, you know, basically like unlacquered leather over a large uh, radius cord and and that isn't necessarily bad but I don't think the execution in terms of aesthetics is particularly great here. It's also worth noting that the risers on uh, either end of the grip as well as in the center are, are very subtle and they don't stand out as particularly crisp. Now that's that's kind of the thing is this grip looks just in general kind of subtle. It doesn't it doesn't have a lot of crisp refinements to it and it feels very comfortable in a, in a bare hand but at the same time 
it doesn't have some of the just refined characteristics aesthetically that I might like to see or that I personally prefer. Uh, in terms of performance, I don't know that it necessarily really impacts you. It seems to be a, a structurally functional grip, but I don't like that some of the aesthetic characteristics just don't stand out as, as well as I might like. And in a glove, they're even more obscured. I can't feel really where the risers are as I have a glove in my hand. Not that that's necessarily an important factor, but I suppose it's worth noting. The other thing to note is that the grip is, is big. It's a substantial grip. Now I have big giant sausage hands. Uh, and the thing to note is that it, you know, it feels actually comfortable in my hand, but I would say that this grip is gonna be on the larger side. And most people may not appreciate that. Well, I don't know about most people, depending on what your hand size is. For me, it's comfortable. I can get my hands around it. It feels like it rests in my hand. But honestly, even though I have big giant sausage fingers, uh, I prefer sometimes a more medium or smaller grip in my hands. It really lets me get a, a sense of control over the blade that otherwise I might lack. Now this is comfortable enough, but I think some people, if you have smaller or medium sized hands, this might be a little bit more than, than you want to have in terms of a grip size. It's not axe handled, it's not bad, it doesn't stand out over the, the cross guard or anything like that, but it's still very very hefty. In terms of the cross guard, the cross guard is from what I can gather a style 6 cross guard if I had to put it into an oak shot typology, though I don't know that I necessarily have to. Uh, the thing is that it's sharp. It pokes me in the hands. It's not very comfortable. I, I banged this into my head as I was moving around, though admittedly I'm more of a Japanese or Filipino martial arts guy, and where I bring the, the sword in relation to my head is not conducive to a large cross guard. Uh, nevertheless, it, as I moved it around, I found that it just the ridges on it are very crisp, so the, the crisp edges that it lacks on the pommel, uh, it definitely has sharp edges on the cross guard, and I don't know if I really like that. It seems like I'm Goldilocks in this situation where one's too soft and one's too hard, and I just am not finding a happy medium. Uh, I found this to, to cause me a deal of uh, a, a reasonable amount of discomfort depending on different scenarios that I was using the blade in, but it was noticeable in a few different iterations. If I choked up on the cross guard, uh, I felt it on my hands. The cross guard poked me in a couple places where at the, the end of the quillins, um, it just wasn't wasn't a terribly comfortable cross guard. Now it looks really cool. I, I like the way it looks. It's maybe a little small, but it does, it does have a pleasant appearance to it. I suppose the other thing to note is that there was again rust on the cross guard. I polished it up a little bit. The thing to note though is that it's made out of some sort of rustable material, so I, I, I'm guessing it's some sort of carbon steel, so it's a pretty resilient piece. In terms of transitions, uh, the grip doesn't overlap the cross guard, something that I, I kind of aesthetically like to see. I don't like it when the grip kind of flows over the cross guard, in this case it does not, I find that pleasant. It has some ridges, it's on center, it's good, however I'm able to see a pretty significant gap around the blade where the cross guard meets it. And in that gap, I see a lot of resin or epoxy, which is unsightly. I mean, it does the job. I'd rather have that than a gaping hole that water could go down. If you're using this and you're cutting or whatever, water could get in there and cause some problems with the handle or rust the blade. In this case, I'd prefer epoxy than nothing. And the epoxy appears to be dressed. It's just that the cross guard gap is larger than the blade itself. And, and that I see glue filling the hole rather than just no hole at all. Now the hilt in general, if I just talk about how it looks, I actually like the aesthetic of the hilt. It's very pleasant. It reminds me of my Albion Mercenary, which personally I think executed it a little bit better. Um, I like that it's got a mirror polish. The aesthetic honestly is overall very pleasant. So if you're somebody that's looking for something that's just pleasant looking, um, I think this, this certainly does the job. Uh, the downside that I'm going to note is that it looks very big for this type of sword. And for a hand and a half sword, this almost has a long sword style grip. Um, you know, maybe those terms are, are tough for me to... Some people define long sword, half sword, bastard sword in, in different ways. And it's just a little tough for me to ascertain what, what this is supposed to be. But this feels more like a two-handed grip to me. Now we can talk about the scabbard, or as I'm going to refer to it, a shipping container. Now it looks nice, it's leather wrapped, the seam on it is straight, it seems adequately stitched. I mean it's not necessarily wonderful, but for the price I think it's actually pretty good. The downside, and the reason I referred to it as a shipping container, is that as I put the sword in it, it just falls out. It doesn't hold onto it at all, and it rattles. Like a lot. It rattles a lot. It rattles uh, horizontally and horizontally. Horizontally, it rattles horizontally and vertically. It seems like it does not fit this 
this particular sword at all. Uh, aesthetically, it looks very pleasant, but it just it doesn't do the job that a scabbard is supposed to do, and I don't really know of a way to to remedy it falling out and not rattling every way. I could stuff cotton balls down here, and that would probably grab the tip, um, but then I have cotton balls stuffed down there, and if I put the sword in with moisture, there's not really an easy way for it to kind of wick out, shy of, you know, drying it for a very long time, which I, I suppose I could do, but that seems like a... I don't know, like, just, it's not the way it's supposed to be. So from that end, I, I don't particularly like it. The leather um, aesthetically matches reasonably well. Depending on the light, the handle tends to be slightly different than the, the scabbard, but it takes almost direct sunlight to spot a difference. In, in most lights, it looks very, very similar. Uh, the leather appears to be of a reasonable quality. It's got metal components, uh, you know, at least one, one metal component. Um, but I, I can't get over the rattle. It, it is, it permeates every experience I have with the scabbard and I, um, I use it just really for storage. Other than that, I, I don't really like to use it. Now, as I take the blade out, it has a reasonable sound. It looks uh, nice and it, it's not hard to draw if you were to have it, though I'd have to urge a lot of caution if you were to actually keep it on your person because if you bend over, it could, it could fall out depending on how you're your harness or apparatus for holding the sword works. The blade, let's talk about the blade. Smarter people than me have classified this as an oak shit type 16. And I call it oak shit because that's what the smart people said. Most notably because it's not a 16A, it kind of resembles a 16A blade, at least that's what the, the smarter HEMA folks were, were able to say. But uh, it doesn't exactly qualify or classify as any particular typology from Oakshot's system. And I suppose that's an important thing to note. In my personal opinion, it doesn't have to. Uh, DSA is open to take some artistic license with their works. I, I applaud them for it. And in fact, many of their pieces are have some fantasy inspiration that look like they could have existed. And anyway, that's not the point. Uh, the trick is that they call this a 15th century hand and a half sword. And I don't know how accurate that name is. Uh, given that I'm not able to find something that replicates this in the 15th century. It's not modeled after anything I, I was exactly able to find. Uh, it seems like it takes some artistic license, and frankly, I think it looks cool. I'm not dogging on him for that, but I suppose it is an important thing to note that it doesn't fit at any point I was able to find in history. Though, admittedly, as many of you know, I am no awesome student of history. And if you are able to find something, I would welcome it if you threw that in the commentary down below. Uh, we could all be smarter for having that knowledge. Now, uh, in terms of other stuff on the blade, the, the, edge, uh, the edge is just not very sharp, frankly. Um, and I don't know that it has to be. I'm making a lot of excuses for DSA here. The, the point is that the edge can cut paper. It did not, as you will see later, cut to Tommy very well. Um, I didn't find it much of a cutting edge at all, which if you're looking for half-sorting ability, if you're looking for something that is a more durable edge, maybe this is the sharpness that you should go for. However, uh, swords, I think, are supposed to cut, and this is not a good, good, cutty edge. It's, uh, it's adequate, but I found, I found it to be a little lackluster in its, in its sharpness, and in kind of how the secondary bevel is set up. It's a reasonably thick blade, and the bevel is, is I don't know, it just doesn't, doesn't have a very good edge. Uh, it's also worth noting that whoever did the sharpening on this, and now this is a secondhand sword, so I can't say for sure DSA did it, but this it appears whoever did the sharpening on it uh, from wherever the original sharpening was done, kind of the apparatus they were using to grind on it got away from a little bit, and there are some blemishes towards the tip that if I were a, the purchaser of this sword and had, had seen that come on a brand new sword, I would be very disappointed. Again, I can't hold my finger or point my finger at DSA for this one. It's secondhand. Who knows? Maybe somebody else sharpened it. Maybe it was done by a different distributor. It was a blunt originally and then got sharpened. Uh, my suspicion is it came this way, but I can't say for sure that that happened. Uh, that's that's very speculative on my part. Other dynamic properties of the blade worth noting, there's very little distal taper. Now, obviously, it has a pretty pronounced taper uh, one way, but the, the thickness of the blade does, is not, doesn't really change throughout. It maintains a pretty consistent thickness. And I, I don't know, that it seems weird. The dynamic properties of this, if it did, I'd imagine that the balance point would probably be below the cross guard. But, uh, <laughs> so maybe it's good that they didn't. But it doesn't have a very pronounced distal taper, and I think 
pieces from this period, I, I don't know if they would or frankly wouldn't. Uh, despite the lack of, of distal taper, um, the blade's still actually pretty flexible. Uh, you can, you can, it bends pretty easy, it wiggles a lot, uh, even though it, it has a pretty consistent thickness, um, it's not, it's not very rigid. The fuller also terminates in what I would consider an odd spot. It seems to finish a bit odd for, for something that's this typology, and maybe one of the main points that kind of casts it away from fitting into a, a well, one of the, the points, I suppose, that makes it not fit into any particular historic category. Uh, not that, again, it has to. The, the point is that it, it does terminate in kind of a weird spot, and it makes it, it almost makes me a little nervous, like it's going to break there. It didn't, it bent, it flexed, it didn't break, it didn't, it didn't do anything, but it does seem like a bit of an odd spot for the fuller to finish. Something worth noting is that the fuller actually terminates in the same spot uh, on both sides, which is a good thing. Now, it terminates in the same spot. However, I would note that the fuller kind of wobbles off the central ridge, uh, and it, while it finishes at the same spot, it does kind of wander off on one edge versus the other. I'm not expecting perfection for a sword in this price point, uh, but having nice, crisp, clean lines is always appreciated, and when when that uh, is not the case, it's worth pointing out. The other thing worth noting is that the there are just a ton of wiggly wobblies all over this the flats of this blade. Uh, I've talked to, to Mr. Pierce about this some time ago in an interview, and uh, he noted that in the period it was acceptable and it's not really that big a deal. Performance-wise, it doesn't impact anything. So having to kind of make the planes of a sword flat are, is an enormous amount of work and that adds to the cost and this is not a terribly expensive sword. However, this seems very reminiscent of like windless swords. It's, it's very uneven along the surface. That doesn't obviously impact performance. It doesn't really change the structural integrity of the blade. There's no, there's no significant performance uh, or, or quality impact other than aesthetically it's unpleasing to the eye. I appreciate when, when planes are flat, and when uh, when somebody's hand making and hand forging or hand grinding a blade, I you know I understand that it takes a lot more effort, a lot more steady hands, a lot more sanding to, to make that happen, and inherently a lot more cost. But uh, quite often I see Japanese katana type things out of China in the sub two hundred dollar price point that have pristine flat edges. Now. They are, as Mr. Pierce was saying, kind of block sanded. They're set on something flat and, and kind of slid from side to side. I don't know if that's necessarily the case in the construction of these blades. Um, but I do like to see flat edges, at least flat planes. This does not have them, and, uh, and it wiggles a lot more than, than many of the other mass production pieces that I've seen. Now, the blade itself is supposed to be a 60 HRC and made of some type of steel or another, and a lot of people are really interested in what steel things are made from. So long as the manufacturer is, is, uh, knows how to work with that steel, I don't really know. And frankly, as a reviewer, I have no way of testing to say, this steel is this, that, or the other, or it's this particular hardness. I'm sure there are things I could do to do that, but they are um, lazy man prohibited in the sense that I would have to buy stuff and then do more stuff, and I don't, I don't want to. Uh, suffice to say, though, I did whack a few things with it. It held an edge, didn't bend or flare, you know, it, it bent, but it sprung right back. Uh, it didn't take any edge damage, there were no particular issues, so whatever steel they're using, it seems sufficient to be a sword. Now let's talk about dynamics. In terms of point control, honestly, it's, it's a really comfortable sword, and I feel very connected to the point. Uh, this dropped point of balance that I mentioned earlier is probably contributing to that. Overall, it's just it's very controllable. I feel very connected to the point. In one hand or in two hands, it seems easy for me to thrust. It seems easy for me to get the point where it's supposed to go in general. I did a couple, you know, quick little passes on a dry tatami mat trying to thrust between the gap uh, where the, the end of the roll was just to simulate rough armor in a, in a very meh circumstance. Now, I'm not very good at finding the gap. That isn't a thing that I, I typically do. It's not something I practice, so I am resoundingly bad at it. Uh, but I did find that half-sorting added a level of control. I still wasn't really able to get it into the gap between the tatami. I can imagine that if you are working against a moving, skilled opponent wearing plate armor, trying to find a seam that's even smaller than this would be would be cumbersome. However, if you were thrusting into chainmail, um, the dynamics allowed me to, you know, kind of control that. And 
the blade is overall, I suppose, on the more flexible side. So if I show the Sword Dynamics computer here, uh, what you're going to see is, you know, some stuff. And I don't exactly know how this is supposed to relate to other European swords, but there you go. Maybe it provides you with more information. What I can say from a, a more tangible sense of dynamics is that in one hand, the blade felt controllable. In two hands, the blade felt more controllable. Half sorting, the blade improved and I, I felt like I was able to thrust again with more control, though uh, I didn't find at any point the blade terribly rigid. So as I think about the context of, of thrusting through chainmail, the, the ridge in it didn't really feel conducive to me. It always flexed. It always, you know, had a little bit of bend to it. And I don't know that the Dynamics computer is necessarily going to show that, but the blade is, is actually reasonably flexible. Even with half sorting, it, you know, if I was really pressing into an opponent, uh, I would maybe struggle with, with getting this blade to expand a chainmail ring that was, was well made. Uh, now in the cut, in moving the blade around, this is where the, the two-handed sword aspect kind of comes in. Uh, it felt really, really hefty to move around with one hand. Uh, it was not comfortable at all to, to do any kind of rotations with. I didn't feel comfortable or controllable. I could thrust with the blade held out and it felt balanced so long as I was keeping it relatively still. But as soon as I moved it around a lot, it became difficult to start and stop moving. And I didn't feel like it was very effective to, to use in that way. So as soon as I used two hands, the blade came alive again. It was easy to move around. But with one hand, I found it very difficult to do any kind of cutting motions. Uh, thrusting motions weren't so bad. Cutting motions, not particularly fun at all. The other thing I should note is as I impact targets, which became maybe more noticeable on the dry tatami than anything else as a, as a couple of strikes ended up meeting, uh, and obviously the dry tatami, man, I'm not trying to cut through it, but what I really noticed is that there is a ton of vibration that is transferred to my hand. So depending on where I grip it, there is a, a variety. A lot of times I tend to choke up on the cross guard, which isn't necessarily the way you would use it, but even if I move down an inch or so, there's still just a lot of vibration that is that is felt in my hand. Where the nodes are placed on this sword isn't necessarily conducive to to where you would maybe typically hold the sword for it to feel balanced and controllable in your hand. If I move down on the grip, it, it, I can change the dynamics of how it feels in terms of wobbliness in my hand, and I extend my reach, but I almost lose that kind of comfort in where the balance point is and how controllable the tip is. So um, it's a weird balance. I don't know if that's historic or not historic, but it's worth noting that where I would conventionally grip with one hand for the purposes of balance and, and use really was not comfortable as soon as I actually struck anything. It, it shook around quite a lot. Now, as odd as it is, one of the few swords that I've had that feels the same and has the same kind of rattly point of balance is that goofy Conan sword back there by my doting daughter. There's a Conan Atlantean in there, and it has very similar dynamics where it wants to shake out of your hands, and it was it was a weird experience using that sword and this sword and, and comparing it to a Conan sword, which weighs like eight and a half pounds. So, uh, anyway... Or maybe it's not eight and a half, but it's, it weighs a lot more than this one, at least double the weight. But the dynamics rattle in my hand quite a bit. Now, in terms of cutting, there's not a whole lot to report here. It's, it's as I noted, kind of a thrust-centric sword, and I'm not using it on any targets that really test its aptitude for thrusting. Uh, in terms of point control, it, it's very controllable. Uh, in terms of how well it cuts, though, it, it cut actually quite crappily. So it did cut into a mat. Uh, but it didn't cut substantially into a mat and it took you know a lot of gusto I really had to use a lot of strength to, to power through a, a mat chop where it actually cut through the mat Otherwise it kind of marred them I'm sure it would be uncomfortable if you were cutting but if you were wearing kind of padded gambeson or or some sort of I mean You know even even a layer like what I'm wearing now I'm not overly confident that it would it would really do much uh, it's a light sword, so it doesn't have a lot of brute kind of force. It doesn't have a lot of impact strength. Uh, it wasn't knocking my mat off or tipping my stand over as I was cutting, and it, it didn't really do a lot of damage. So in most cuts, I'm not confident that it would be the greatest cutter. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be, though, but in, in as, I'm, as I'm comparing cutting, it was not not very comfortable. Also, I had to use two hands with a lot of gusto. As I think of a hand and a half sword, if I'm using one hand to try and cut, I don't think I would I would do much other than irritate or anger my opponent. But that also could have a lot to do with my skill level and the sharpness of the blade. Now this is the sharpened version of the blade. It does come with an edge. The edge wouldn't be what I would call substantial. As I look at this, you know, it does cut in. But it's not, 
you know, it has an edge, but it's not, it's not the greatest edge. It is sharp, but not so sharp that it cut into my glove while I was doing any kind of half sorting exercises. I mean, it certainly didn't cut very well into Tommy. In terms of overall cutting ability, I, I wasn't impressed with it. And it really gave me the sense that as soon as I was using it one-handed to cut, it was very uncomfortable. I needed to have two hands to generate enough speed to do any damage and just in general to make a, a cut with any purchase. Uh, one-handed became exhausting very quickly. The last thing I want to touch on is something very briefly uh, but is important to note and that is some of the quality control issues that have been known to happen with Dark Sword Armory products. Uh, sometimes the tangs are insufficiently heat treated and sometimes they're of an insufficient size with little bitty rat tails and in either case that makes the sword ineffective at doing sword related tasks and can turn it into a, a dangerous object. Frankly it turns into a helicopter of death if it breaks and flies off. Uh, you know, when you're not expecting it. The point is that just about every mass production manufacturer has some sort of quality control issue that's happened. I don't know whether it happens more frequently or less frequently with Dark Sword Armory. Uh, I've seen lots of their products take a lot of abuse and hold up well and have seen happy customers and I've seen people that have been very dissatisfied uh, to find out that their the tang on, on their blade seems to be uh, wildly insufficient and obviously something that shouldn't shouldn't have happened and the real unfortunate thing is a customer is there's no way to just easily disassemble the sword to see if you have a problem or not uh, generally speaking it's pretty easy to tell if the tang is too small it's a lot harder to tell if it's not heat treated properly at least with the naked eye and, and you know no skill in metallurgy or something uh, but you can see if it's a little bitty rat tail tang unfortunately you have to disassemble the sword by grinding off the peen and hammering off the hilt and then it's probably going to sustain sustain some damage after having done that and then it requires skill and tools to put it back together. So as a customer, there's no reassuring way other than, you know, swing at something and hope it doesn't break. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's not really a great model for testing. Unfortunately, it's, it's the best one I know of. So I suppose my recommendation would be if you do opt to buy a Dark Sword Army product, do so knowing that there, there may be some quality control issues. If you buy any sword, know that there may be some quality control issues. It is a factor when you buy something. It seems to be perhaps slightly more of a factor with Dark Sword Armory or more of a, a concern by some, some small measure. Um, it doesn't concern me that much personally, and I would just say test the sword. If you buy, if you opt to buy this sword or any other product from Dark Sword Armory, just be sure you, you give it a good old what for to see if you have any issues. And uh, the good news is if you buy a product from Dark Sword Armory, at least from an authorized distributor or them directly, they seem to have good customer service in the sense that they will resolve the issue for you. Um, at least that's the case or the impression I get from Thomas. I haven't had any of the products break on me personally. I've had a few Dark Sword Armory products. I've swung them at things uh, that are harder than I probably should have and I haven't, I haven't had an issue. So uh, to me personally it hasn't, it's been a non-issue but I can't help but recognize that it is an issue in the community and something that I would want to know if I were a potential buyer. The thing I would put in contrast as you look at some of the issues is that every manufacturer has had issues. In my opinion it seems like other manufacturers have maybe taken more steps to rectify them in a more public way or in a more effective way. Um, in any case it doesn't really give me a lot of a lot of concern with most of the products that they have out there. Though it is a factor I definitely consider when I'm buying something and I hope it's helpful to know that. So is it worth it? Well let's uh, do a quick recap here. The sword looks good to me. Uh, the scabbard is is garbage and doesn't function very well. The dynamics are weird. It feels comfortable in one hand from the thrust standpoint, but it wants to wiggle out of my hand anytime I actually have impact. It's very flexible, so if I'm trying to expand any any rings, I'm not overly confident there. And there, I don't know, there's just too many downsides for me to call it a good sword, but is it worth the money? You know, to me, uh, $475, no. I, I talked about some of the other options that were out there. Uh, to me, this one is just, I don't know, it misses the mark a little too much. Uh, the fuller's in a weird spot from a historical standpoint. I, I, don't, I don't know that it really represents a 15th century sword or, or not. Uh, so as I think about who is, who is this sword for, uh, from the historic enthusiast, I don't know that this represents with a lot of accuracy what you would expect to find in a 15th century hand and a half sword, either from the dynamic handling characteristics or just from the overall execution of where the fullers and all that are, though I'm not honestly prepared to say that it is or isn't because I'm, I'm certainly no expert there. From a practitioner standpoint though, it doesn't have a lot of purchase in the cut, it doesn't do a very good job cutting, does it need to? No, but it's also on the flexible side. The dynamics are weird and from a, from a point control perspective, if you're looking for a thrust centric sword, 
I don't I don't know that it does you know it is controllable in that aspect but it, it also wants to wiggle out of your hand and maybe has a little more flex than it should for something that's meant to you know maybe expand rings and chain mail or something like that so from a practitioner standpoint I don't know that this would be my first choice either now if you're a budget conscious person that person that wants something that's effective and useful and, and cool looking. Well, it is cool looking, I will give you that. Uh, but from a budget perspective, $475 isn't the cheapest. Even the options that come with the scabbard, there are less expensive options that I talked about a moment ago. Uh, and I don't know, it seems like you can, you can find something that will be equally as good or bad uh, for less money. So I don't know that the budget conscious person is necessarily having their needs met here either. As a collector, if you are a, a collector-centric person, well, collect what you want. If you want it, then yeah, I, I could see that if, if you're just a collector and it suits your fancy, get it, but I don't know that as an investment it's going to improve or be worth more money in the future. It doesn't seem like these are limited in any way or have some sort of characteristic where they're gonna end. So I don't know as an investment if it's gonna improve in value uh, or as a collector, I don't know. If you're a collector, you collect what you want. And if you want this, then go buy it. It doesn't seem like inherently the unit is a ripoff or something like that. I, I wouldn't describe it as uh, not worth the money, but it does seem like there are better ways to spend that money. At least that that's kind of where I stand right now. I have a lot of difficulty feeling where where would this one be from? There are offerings from a myriad of different companies that have some some other cool stuff about them. Or as I talk about the Albion piece that has you know kind of more refined artistic characteristics to it and shapes. Uh, and, and a lot of the gripes I would have about this sword are, are reconciled with the Albion piece. It's twice the amount of money, and it doesn't have a scabbard, though this one has a scabbard, but as I, as I articulated, it's more of a shipping container. Um, so the Albion at $880 versus $475, it doesn't seem like that's an enormous jump. It's twice the price, but it seems like it addresses all of those issues, and I, I would probably be more inclined to spend more money and get something that addresses my concerns or less money and something that uh, that seems to have equal amounts of badness, or maybe a, a couple couple one ups. Now, when I say four hundred dollars is not a lot of money to jump up to an Albion or twice the price, I, I, it's not lost on me that that is a substantial amount of money and very meaningful, and you should guard that money because you earned it. The point is, though, that if you were to send this Dark Sword Armory 15th century hand and a half sword off to somebody that was capable of doing the work or rectifying some of the issues that I've noted with it, the gap in the cross guard, the grip, the length of the grip, the size of the any of those types of characteristics, the edge and repro, it seems like all of that would cost more than $400. So it's not lost on me that $400 is a lot of money. I just think of if I talk about shipping and time and getting another queue, queue of a craftsman. Um, now maybe you have the aptitude to fix those issues yourself. I don't because I'm, I'm not handy that way. Anyway, that's what makes me think the $400 isn't such a substantial thing because I couldn't buy that, that work cheaper. Anyway, that's, that's my thoughts. I hope it's of some assistance to you and that's, that's all I have for you. As always, Cheers, and thanks for watching.